With the big rover, the next phase of my plan was to build a large ship, one capable of transporting the rover and could be used as a mobile base, with a large refinery, assembler, plenty of storage, and room left over. But what I came up with seemed peculiar. So let's take a look at what I've got going, and you tell me if it'll even fly. So there is a master plan behind what I'm doing. I need this large ship to transport the rover and use as a mobile base, because I'm moving my entire operation over to an ice lake. I finally found after doing some longer range reconnaissance with the jetpack. With the ice, I can stock up and get plenty of hydrogen and oxygen to take the mobile base to space. Find a suitable asteroid, asteroid field, or moon, or something, and build a space station. But first, one thing at a time. I need the big ship. And before building the big ship, it was time for some expansion of my platform. Even at this stage, it was time to start doing some calculating. The big rover was nine large grid blocks wide. So at minimum, I needed some sort of interior space that was at least that width with a little room to spare. And it was also nine blocks long. So any interior hold needed to be at least that big. It was also three blocks tall with the wheel suspension set at midpoint. Now for the width, I had a little wiggle room because with the wheels, they don't take up a full hit box on that outer block when they're pointed straight. So I figured an interior space nine blocks wide would just fit and I'd make it 11 blocks long for a little extra space on each end. And making it four blocks high would give me a little headroom. The total size of the ship would obviously be bigger than that with at least one block for the hull and probably a couple more for thrusters. And there was the rest of the ship for the refinery, assembler, storage, and cockpit, and whatever else I'd need. It really wasn't completely planned out, but I'd just start with it needing to carry the rover and go from there. With a large enough platform and blocks being laid, I was just gonna go for an unwelded skeleton to test out how things would work. And I've gotta be honest, it seemed like what I was building was a flying box. I really wasn't happy. I mean, I've seen the amazing ships people build, and this was not it. The game has a lot of blocks with different angles and shapes, but I figured I just first needed to get the overall size and layout, and I could try to make it look better as I went along. And I did start to like some of the ribcage sides and whatnot. So there was hope. With the rover loading, I almost immediately abandoned my first idea. I was gonna make a loading ramp that would fold up and carry the rover completely inside of a bay. But then I had a better idea. I'd make it so I'd drive the rover underneath the ship, then build a kind of mechanism that would reach down, grab the rover and lift it up high enough for safe transport, basically carrying it underneath the ship. That would all be at the rear, and the forward part of the ship could just be one giant room to hold up my machinery, and could be my airtight area for when the ship eventually made it to space. With the undercarry mechanism, I also thought it might be better for docking a mining ship once I reach space, or maybe I could even make some interchangeable modules, like a big drilling apparatus where in space I could attach it and then slowly lower the ship down over some asteroid and devour its contents. Maybe. This build was a continual learning experience and a really enjoyable part of the game. Just figuring out the size of things and how it all fit together. And I did all of this purely in survival mode. I know, it's a lot easier to test things out in creative mode than replicate that in survival. But I wanted to make all the successes and failures in survival mode and feel that sting when things go wrong and celebration when they go right. But truly, I was totally winging it with this build. It was gonna be trial and error in live testing. My next important thing to figure out was about power. Now, the game has presented to players a nice variety of options, whether you're in atmosphere or in space, to power and lift your ship. It's actually pretty surprising. In fact, 
I think all the options and combinations are worthy of their own video. But for now, I'll go over what I went with and why, because it was kind of my only choice. I decided to use atmospheric thrusters and power them with batteries. I didn't have any uranium to power a reactor and wasn't near any ice to generate hydrogen, either for hydrogen thrusters or a hydrogen engine. Yeah, like I said, it needs its own video. But what the atmospheric thrusters needed was electricity, so batteries it would be. How many thrusters? I had no idea, but it needed lift. Lots of lift. This was a heavy ship. So large thrusters for vertical lift and small ones for forward, reverse and side maneuvering. That's what I figured anyway. For this ship, I also decided I didn't need down thrusters. Gravity would be enough, I hoped. The large thrusters on a large grid ship produce a tremendous amount of thrust capable of lifting about 660,000 kilograms. So all I needed to do, I figured, was watch the total weight of the ship and leave some room to spare. Comparatively, the small thrusters on a large grid ship only produce about 59,000, a little less than one-tenth of the large thrusters. So yeah, you need about 10 small ones to get the lift of one big one. The one big one is very power hungry, but oddly, thrust to energy used is a little more efficient. The big one also has a much bigger damage distance from the end of the thruster. I wondered why this hole had suddenly shown up on my platform. It seemed odd. Had I accidentally hit it with a grinder? No, the thruster had blown a hole in it, so an immediate reconfiguration was needed. I actually liked the raised supports, as the high engines seemed a little reminiscent of the Mandalorian ship, the Razor Crest, with those same high-mounted engines. And it was also helping break up just the overall box structure of this whole ship. A couple small forward thrusters, a couple backward thrusters to slow down, and a single side thruster for each port and starboard movement. And voila, I had a ship, or most of one, I wasn't sure how many batteries I'd need, but decided to start with 10. And batteries setting anywhere on the ship's grid will power everything, including the thrusters. And that's good, which is another benefit of the atmospheric thrusters over the hydrogen thrusters, because they don't require any conveyor piping. You can just put them anywhere. Lastly, you have to have a gyroscope. It's mandatory. The heavier the ship, the more it seems you need to keep it stable and maneuverable. So I'd start with one and see. Now with 10 batteries, this ship needed some time to charge. So some more wind turbines to crank that up was in order. And while I was waiting, it was time to get that rover lift mechanism built and tested. A piston would do the lifting. But for the connection, I considered using a connector or a hinge. Yes, my beloved hinge. In the end, the hinge won out, but it was purely a space utilization decision. The hinge is in two parts, but they fit together, so winds up only taking one block of space. The connector requires a full-size block on the connector side of the ship and on the rover side. So just to shorten the whole story, I didn't have to do as much reconfiguration with the hinge. Now to keep Clang happy, I had to create a wider space around the piston because the piston head doesn't like to slide past existing blocks. But on a fortunate side, the piston head takes up a little fractional bit of space. So when the piston is fully raised, it kept the top of my rover's blocks just grazing the ceiling of the ship bay. So there shouldn't be a lot of bumping and wear. Coincidentally, the front hinge on the rover I had been using as a charging point conveniently lined up with a place where I could put a hinge head on the ship, which would allow two points of attachment for security. All was well, but would it fly? She may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts, kid. Well, a little splash of random paint here and there to ensure it was truly ugly, and test flight one was successful. I didn't carry the rover on this first trip or a lot of cargo, but it flew and it handled pretty well. Its first flight 
was to go over and visit the ENAT station that had been tagged on my GPS for ages. So you'll see what's at that station and see if it can carry the rover without a disaster. And I promise the ugly ship is going to get a beautification makeover and something to be proud of in my next video. Till then, take care and don't forget to like and subscribe to follow the adventure.